Hello, everyone. Awesome. Let me get this started. All right, can everybody see my screen? Awesome, sounds good. Okay, let me get started. Uh, my name is Julia, like Julio, but for girls, in case you uh, forget. It's really nice to meet 1,000 of you all. It's crazy. I just want to thank AIGA um, for allowing me to be a part of this amazing opportunity. Now, before I go ahead and start, I wanted to talk about what's in it for you. What does this 10 minutes mean to you? Um, I obviously want you to learn a little bit about myself. I want you to learn about who I am as a designer and as a human being. I want to show you a project that I feel like exemplifies um, the work that I do as a designer. And obviously I also want to hope that this um, is a jumpstart to a conversation about you know, what my I can, um, improve on um, in order to um, improve my portfolio specifically. So a little bit more about me. My name is Julia Fernandez. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm currently a graphic design BFA at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. I also work as a freelance designer um, with graphic and product design. And during my free time, I've actually had a passion project of creating videos that document my uh, journey from being a student to getting into the design industry. Now, why would you hire me uh, amongst other designers? Um, my narrative is really important to me and I believe that I am an ally to my users. Um, I create products that are empathetic, purposeful and empowering. I solve design problems that not only matter to my users, but matter to me. And I believe that my passion and my drive for design really does shine through in my projects. And I hope that you see that today as well. Today I'm going to talk about one specific project um, that I worked on. It was a student project. Um, it took 10 weeks and it was independent. I um, focused on product design as well as uh, brand design and it's a Facebook misinformation case study. Before I dive in, I want to talk about, you know, what got me to this topic of misinformation. Now as an avid user of social media, a shout out to Gen Z, um, I have been um, faced with, you know, a lot of stuff about Black Lives Matter, about COVID-19, about the upcoming presidential election. And unfortunately, I saw um, a common thread amongst those things is a lot of misinformation surrounding that, um, uh, those topics. And I wanted to be a part of the solution um, to this problem. Um, and I had all these impressions, so I wanted to make sure, you know, I had facts um, to back up my opinions. So I went ahead and found um, surveys online um, on, from 2019, and it showed that 86% of internet users admit to being duped by fake news, and 60% of users who get uh, news through social media actually shared fake news. So what that says to me um, as a designer that wants to solve a problem is one, uh, people are vulnerable um, to fake news and two, um, people are uh, contributing to the spread of fake news and I wanted to be um, able to solve this problem through design. So as you saw, I chose Facebook. Now why choose Facebook? Facebook is actually the largest social media platform in the world. It has over 2.4 billion users. And I thought, what better opportunity to target um, the users that are going through misinformation and uh, being exposed to misinformation than to choose the company um, that has the most uh, user scope. So here comes my problem statement. How might I improve Facebook's user interface and brand experience to better address the misinformation problem that it's currently going through? Now, I conducted a lot of research and these are the three methods. The first is I did a, a personal survey that I wrote. Next is I interviewed someone from the misinformation team at Facebook. And third, um, I did other secondary research with articles that were available to me. Now, I got a lot of information, but I'm going to sum it up for you. Um, so from research, um, I saw that misinformation is simply not getting eradicated fast enough on this platform, despite um, AI machine learning that Facebook um, has created as solutions and also human solutions to fact check um, and do all of that. It's just simply not enough with the amount of misinformation that's going into the ecosystem that we call the internet. Um, another thing is people are vulnerable to misinformation and the UI doesn't necessarily directly um, look to solve this problem. And I saw that as a designer myself and as a user. And the third is that Facebook is not actively addressing misinformation 
emphasis on to the user's liking. When I conducted my survey, I saw that over 50% of people didn't even know that Facebook was doing anything about this information. And I wanted to make sure that I um, stood up uh, for Facebook and showed um, what they are actually doing. So my design solution is this. I create an update of the Facebook mobile application that not only addresses, but also eradicates misinformation. To help me solve this problem, I created some personas um, and use cases. So meet Jared. He's really frustrated because he's vulnerable to misinformation, and he has really bad resharing habits when he's exposed to lots of sensational media. Another thing is that he hasn't learned about the best fact-checking practices simply because he's not exposed to resources, and I wanted to solve that problem for him. The next persona is Clara. Um, as opposite to Jared, he is um, sensitive, as she is sensitive to misinformation, and she's an sees an overwhelming amount of fake news on Facebook. She has skills, but she doesn't know how to implement these things. Um, so I wanted to also um, make sure that I look at her problems. So this brings me to my solutions. So um, the third first uh, solution that I have is specifically for Clara, which is this idea of a community review. I thought that there's a lot of um, Facebook users that actually could actually help with this problem. So I thought, why not appoint users to become fact checkers? This expedites the process of taking um, the misinformation that's potential to third party fact checkers that Facebook hires that actually decides whether or not something is misinformation or not. The user is actually able to personalize this experience by seeing the types of information that they want to be able to fact check in their uh, review feed. So what's a review feed? This is a concept that I created in, that is like compared to the actual news feed that you go through right now. It essentially um, is a feed where people can look at different potential misinformation as a community reviewer, go through it and be able to flag and rate different types of misinformation. This not only um, helps Facebook machine learning to flag potential misinformation, it also encourages a culture of fact checking throughout the users of Facebook. Now, I also wanted to um, point out that I wanted to create a new normal on Facebook. Um, as, you as I said, Jared was having a hard time figuring out if something was misinformation or not, and I wanted to solve this problem by showing um, ways that um, users and their experience can have friction um, added to their experience so that they can stop and really think about um, what they are sharing. So here, it discourages users to share impulsively, um, as Facebook has made it very easy to share everything, and it encourages users to understand the root of the problem as to why a post could potentially be misinformation. Finally, I wanted to make a long-term solution. As you probably may know, on the current Facebook app, there is a COVID um, uh, coronavirus information center. And I thought, you know, hopefully, once the world is uh, in a better place, um, there could be a long-term and ever-relevant um, section that can be added to the Facebook app, which is the misinformation center that I have devised. Um, here, you can um, see updated new resources for our friend Jared, um, and it also spreads awareness of misinformation on the platform, such as with trending misinformation posts. So as a graphic designer as well, I said, why stop there? Facebook has an amazing brand and is very strong, to be completely honest, from a design standpoint. And I thought, how could I extend this to different user experiences other than just product design? So I went ahead and created a Facebook misinformation campaign. I thought to myself, what um, type of advertisements would I like to see with this movement? So I, de I decided to extend um, what I knew about the Facebook brand and created an accessible and very inviting um, uh, advertisement um, scheme, as you can see here. And hopefully once people are able to walk around and see this, it would uh, catch their eye and incite their um, uh, interest about misinformation. The next thing is I also wanted to look at what would this look like if it was a publication ad. So here I used language that Facebook uses and created um, public advertisements, publication advertisements that would be memorable and also incite people to learn more. Now, if I had more time, I would actually create user tests with validating metrics to say, hey, I actually did this, and this is the um, measurable outcome um, that I did to improve. Another thing is I would explore more in-depth UI trade-offs and create an interactive prototype so people like you, people who I present to, can actually go through the narrative that I'm speaking through. 
And the big takeaway that I think this project gave me was the fact that design systems are a huge asset in any type of design project. The successful use of a design system is dependent on your true understanding and how much you want to put into um, the application of the design that you create. Now, that is one of the various projects that um, I have completed. So if you'd like to see more of my projects, you can go ahead to my website, juliofernandez.design. And then I just wanted to say thank you for everyone um, listening and tuning in. Um, and you can uh, go ahead and add me on social media as well as LinkedIn and all of that. And I can't wait um, to hear what you guys think about it. So thank you so much for listening, everyone. Leah, thank you so much for going first. Um, I'll turn it over to Dan so there's as much time as possible. But there were some uh, chat questions for you, Julia, about uh, what font you were using for that, the titles, and then also uh, how you made that presentation, what software you're using. And I'll let you answer that as you um, transition to talking. Yeah, of course. Um, so I love this typeface. It's called Sharp Grotesque. Um, there's different, it's a super family. Um, I was able to find a super family, thank the type gods. Um, and also I'm just using um, the super family of Helvetica New, 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 who knows. Um, but yeah, I that is uh, great. And also I am using something that's very new. It's called beautiful.ai. I highly recommend it. Um, it makes um, the user experience of creating a deck so much uh, more fun and interactive. So I highly recommend that. Julia, that was awesome. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> that was, OK, so. I can stop sharing my screen. Give me one second. Actually, do, do you mind keeping it up? Because I might oh, ask yeah, you to jump back. OK, so I might ask you to jump back to a couple slides. Yeah. Uh, there's a version of this critique that would be very short, which is that all of this was incredible. You did an amazing job presenting. You did, you, you present better than most of the people that I've seen present, like creative directors, art directors. You do, you present better than I do. I've been presented for a long time. You helped me learn something. Your pacing was perfect. It wasn't too slow. It wasn't too fast. I would hire you on the spot. Uh, email me later. <laughs> we should talk about that. Okay. Um, I'm, there was a comment in the chat where somebody said like, Julia, we see creative direction in your future. So as a student, I don't know how, like, I don't know how this could have been any better. Um, and, and what I, what I look at is like, if you're a student now, that means you haven't even had the chance in your lifetime to put in the 10,000 hours quite yet. So, so you're only going to get better than this. Like what an incredible baseline you have for being a good designer, being a good communicator. All of this stuff was very articulate. It was you helped me learn, which is the point of a presentation. So I'm like, oh, you're only going to get better than that. Um, so if you're up for it, I'd like to critique your work as if you are an art director or creative director instead. Absolutely. Okay. I'm also that, so. <laughs> I would be more harsh, uh, and, and maybe harsh is the wrong word. I would be more critical, I think, with okay. someone who I expect to do what you did. I didn't expect it. I think that's part of the context is I don't expect a student to do it the way that you did. You did so. I do expect an art director to make this kind of presentation. So I'll critique you as if you are an art director. Um, one of the things that I look for, and and I should mention that a lot of the a lot of critique exists in context, right? So the way that I critique your work is going to be very different than how someone else critiques your work. It's going to be different than if you were presenting a different piece of work about. It. So all of this critique exists in the context of. What, what do I, as a hiring manager, what do I, as an agency owner, what do I tend to look for in good work? And what do I tend to look for in how, pe how people are being professional? So two of the things that I look for with art directors, with creative directors, is I look for what, what risks you took, and I look for how you deal with change. And one of the things that I'm looking at in your presentation was that it was too perfect. Um, and when and when things are too perfect, it makes me kind of squint at it. That's that's partly my personality. That's the context of who I am as a person. It makes me squint at it to go, there's there's something that I'm missing because it's not quite human yet. So you described a very good project. You described a very good outcome, and it almost read like a fairy tale, right? It read like there was this problem, and I addressed it this way, and then we partied. Uh, and and so what I would ask you, what I would ask back to you is like and. You, you, you did address this somehow, too, already in your work. Well, you said, if I had more time, here's some things that I would do. So that's kind of getting in the same direction. 
But one of the things that I'm curious about that I can't tell from this presentation is what if something changed? How well would you have dealt with that? Like, what if you had this idea, you got it in front of a bunch of people and a thousand people hated it, right? Like people started to write on Twitter or Facebook, you know, like, this is terrible. I can't believe they launched this feature. This is the word. Like, how would you as a designer deal with that? Um, and, and that's not in your presentation. So I'd be curious, like, what thoughts do you have about that? And then how might that be in your presentation? Right. Um, I think that that's a really interesting um, kind of, like, uh, like, extension of the, you know, if I had more time. And I think that I think that's a really, um, really helpful feedback because I think, um, as a designer, you want to be able to learn, um, like to figure out worst case scenario, what can happen and how you can adapt. And I definitely think that within, um, the measures of this project, you know, I may have like thought about those things, but it's, I think the more important part is like, like you said, kind of being able to highlight what exactly what I, I would do. Um, and I think that, you know, I would come up with different solutions um that's a really interesting problem like a, a new design problem in itself um and i'm curious to hear like what you think about too about like how it's essentially like having plan b c and z um and i'm wondering um within the scope of a hypothetical project how far would you expect someone to go you know in that manner uh, honestly less than you showed so, so like you're already doing above and beyond. So, so this is like, how do you take an A plus presentation and make it A plus plus plus, right? <laughs> That's kind of the conversation that we're having right now. I right. wouldn't expect any more than you've done for a like for for a, especially for a fictitious example. It would be different if I was talking to you as an art director. Likely, this would have been a real project that you were showing me that you did for Facebook or at Facebook when you were there or something like that. And right. so I would say. You know, and that's how I would critique it. I would go, well, what happened in phase two and three and four and five? Because that's the stuff that happens on real projects. It's hard to approximate that on projects that you're making up on your own. And so that is a question that I have about, like, in thinking about hiring you, I'm like, I don't know what you would do with that scenario. So this project doesn't have to answer that. But somewhere else in your portfolio, if you could answer that, that would be a good thing. Like, so there's a lot of sizzle in this project. Maybe the, the next project that you show is much less sizzle but much more realistic. And then I get a good sense of a, as a hiring manager to go, oh, I see, like this is how you would approach that kind of work and this is how you would approach another kind of work knowing that those are very different constraints. Now we have a, a few minutes left on this. Would you jump back to the first slide where you introduced um, uh, the, the project? Like I wanna see that, that how you introduce it again. Here? Yeah, cool. So, the and this is super duper nitpicky. Right. Um, what I would do on this screen is you haven't really hooked me on the project yet. So you're giving me all the facts about it, right? This is what right. kind of project it was. This was your role. But mm -hmm. I want like a one liner here. Like, give me the reason to want to read this chapter, you know, because I imagine like if this were a longer presentation, this would be one chapter. You'd have maybe two or three other pieces of work. Right. You know, give me the one liner that makes me go, I want to read the rest of this chapter. And you sort of do it a little bit later on where you say, my solution was to create this and this and this, but even that wasn't far enough because it wasn't how. So I want like a one liner here that says like Facebook information, you know, creating uh, solutions through crowdsourcing for how Facebook does a poor job. And then I'm like, oh, like I want to hear more about that because it was a little bit hard for me to track. Like, I'm not sure what your narrative arc is going to be. Right. So, so I'm sort of following along to kind of discover that, but then I'm distracted by like, I have to put some things together in the narrative rather than you giving that to me. Again, this is like art director feedback. This is not like, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't expect you if I was, if I was hiring for a junior designer position, I wouldn't expect that in it. But because this is so above and beyond that, I'm saying like, all right, if you were an art director, I would call you on that, on that thing. Awesome. No, definitely. I think that one thing that I'm uh, learning from portfolio reviews is like, you don't want to make your reviewer do any thinking and do any work. So I think that's awesome feedback and I'll definitely um, keep on working at doing that. Awesome. That's what I got for you, Julia. What, uh, is there anything else I could tell you while we're here, while we've got the time? Um, I did. I was thinking about something about like with hypothetical projects. Um, and again, like kind of looking back at like the scope at being able to present these. Um, do you... Um, as someone that hires junior designers, um, expect also students to have more than one 
uh, project in, in their like portfolio presentation because I was nervous about only having one and I knew that I was going to talk for a really long time. Um, but I was wondering like what you thought about that and, um, you know, what kind of mindset I should have when it comes to presenting my portfolio. Yeah, so I think that um, this is going to be very personal to each reviewer because I, I, don't, I don't know that there's like an industry accepted version. Here's what I would say. I like to see three because three allows me to spot patterns. If you right. show me one, I don't know, like, is that a fluke? Is that like your best project and then every other project sucks? Like number two feels like, yeah, it could be a coincidence. When I get three projects, I'm like, okay, I, I can spot the patterns now of where you go to, what your design tricks are, what you do across, what you do different across each of them. So I think that three is a good number. You know, three to five, you know, allows the reviewer to help to, to see some patterns in that. This was a 10 minute presentation. That's a little bit different, but in a portfolio, I, I like to see about three. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Thank you, Julia, again, for going first and Dan for that feedback. So we'll turn it over to Ileana from Houston now.